Okay, good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to our webinar on federal budget and appropriations, uh, what's in store for education and workforce funding this year. Uh, my name is Kermit Kaliba, and I am the Federal Policy Director here at National Skills Coalition. I'm pleased to welcome everybody here this afternoon uh, for what I think is going to be a really fascinating overview of the, the federal funding process that we're looking at uh, here in 2017. Uh, as, as, as regular listeners know, as, as longtime members of NSC know, we, we usually do a webinar every February where we, uh, we, where we will take a look at the administration's budget request for the upcoming fiscal year and do a deep dive on some of the key funding requests for the uh, federal workforce education and human services programs that impact the populations you're serving. Now this year is obviously a little bit of an unusual year uh, because it's a presidential transition year. We've, we've obviously uh, changed administrations from the uh, Obama administration to the Trump administration. And so, uh, and so the, the budget process is a little bit slower than it would be in other years. Uh, usually incoming administrations in the first year of their, of their tenure uh, don't submit their detailed budgets, their fiscal year budgets, until later in the spring. Folks may remember that when President Obama came into office in 2009, he didn't submit his detailed budget until later in the spring. And we're expecting uh, that the Trump administration is going to do the same thing, uh, that they'll submit a uh, sort of a top-level budget called a kind of uh, what's colloquially referred to as a skinny budget later in March, uh, and then do a fuller, more detailed budget proposal uh, later this spring. Uh, that said, though, we've been getting a lot of questions from the field. Uh, about what to expect uh, for federal budget and appropriations issues and funding levels uh, given the political changes here in Washington. And so we thought it would still be a useful exercise, uh, even though we don't have a full uh, uh, detailed budget uh, proposal from the new administration, we thought it would be useful to sort of take some time to uh, walk folks through where things stand with the budget and appropriations process for fiscal year 2017, uh, talk a little bit about what we're anticipating in fiscal year 2018, and think a little bit about how workforce education and human services programs are likely to be affected. Now, as I said, this is a little bit of a tricky uh, and complicated issue because we're really still dealing with two fiscal year processes. Um, so fiscal year 2017, which is the fiscal year that we're in right now, uh, is uh, we actually have not finalized appropriations for most of the federal uh, for most of the federal government. There are a couple of programs that we were able to finalize before the end of the calendar year, but most programs, including programs that are funded under the Departments of Labor, Education, and HHS, are currently working on a temporary uh, extension called a continuing resolution. Uh, and then, of course, we're heading into fiscal year 2018, which starts in October. Congress is in the process of beginning negotiations around what the budget's going to look like for fiscal year 2018 and starting to think about how funding is going to be allocated in a new legislative and political environment. So, uh, so what we wanted to do was, uh, was bring on some, some experts to talk to us about what's actually happening here in Washington, what are some of the bigger political discussions and policy discussions that are happening on Capitol Hill and in the administration and help sort of think about how we as advocates at the state, at the local, and at the national level can be impacting the funding conversations here in Washington. Uh, if we could go to the next slide. Okay, I'm glad, I'm, I'm very excited today to be joined by two uh, very well respected experts here in Washington on budget and appropriations issues. Uh, Sarah Abernathy, who's with the Committee for Education Funding, and then David Reich from the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. Um, Sarah and David have graciously agreed to spend some time talking with us about the budget and appropriations process, where we are now, and uh, where we're headed. Uh, I'm very excited to have them here uh, and, and, and able to share with us some of their insight and expertise. If we could go to the next slide. Okay, so our goals for today's webinar, and I apologize for the delay in the slides. Our goals for today's webinar, as I said, we're going to try to provide a quick overview of where things stand with the FY uh, fiscal year 2017 appropriations process. 
what is the timeline for the completion of this appropriations process, and what are some of the potential outcomes that we see for education and workforce programs. We're going to provide a little bit of a preview of the fiscal year 2018 budget and appropriations process. What are some of the changes uh, to, the, to the legislative and policy landscape and what can we expect? And then last but not least, we're going to talk a little bit about the budget reconciliation process. Uh, folks may be familiar with reconciliation. This is a, uh, an expedited process that Congress has uh, to move uh, uh, certain pieces of legislation that impact the budget. Uh, we know that there has been some discussion here in Washington about how budget reconciliation could be used to impact a range of different programs, including a number of public assistance programs. So we wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about what that might look like uh, and what are some of the what some of the timeline around that process. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna do this as a, as a sort of an informal conversation style. So I'm gonna be asking uh, Sarah and David a couple of questions just to get us started. And then what we're going to ask you to do is, if, if you have specific questions about anything that Sarah or David uh, may, may reference as part of their, as part of their presentations, uh, or if you have questions uh, about anything that I'm saying, uh, please go ahead and enter those questions into the question box, and we'll try to get to uh, as many of those questions as we can at the end of the, at the moderated portion of, this, of the Q&A. Okay, so without further ado, what I'd like to do is I'd like to turn it over to uh, 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 talking to Sarah. Uh, Sarah, uh, can, we, can you start by just kind of giving us a quick overview of where things stand right now with the fiscal year 27 appropriations process? Can you tell us how we got to this point and what are some of the potential outcomes that we see ahead for education funding that advocates need to be aware of? Sure. Um, if you could turn to the next slide, that would be great. Um, I'd like to thank you, first of all, for inviting me to this, and I will try to be as brief and entertaining as I can, although for those of you who know Budget Wonks, you know that we are very rarely brief and entertaining at the same time. Um, but how we got to this sort of mess we are in federal funding right now is because last year Congress was unable to pass the 12 appropriations bills that fund the whole government, and that was because there are caps on overall non-defense and defense spending, and those caps are very tight. So two years ago, Congress passed a two-year adjustment that increased the caps for defense and non-defense by the same amount. But then when it got to doing the 2017 funding bill, some of the Republicans thought that the caps were too high, and they did not want to appropriate that much. And the bills were considered in the Appropriations Committee but never came to the full Congress to be approved or even voted on because there was this overall agree disagreement. And so at the end of 20, fiscal year 2016, Congress did not have any bills ready. What they did was pass what Kermit referred to as a continuing resolution, which keeps all funding at the 2016 level with some minor adjustments known as anomalies for programs that didn't need to be continued or for some new things that had arisen that had to be dealt with. They did manage to put the funding bill program by program for veterans' health care and get that done, but the rest of the 11 appropriations bills are running under what's known as a CR. And if you look at the slide that's up there right now, you can see that the, in the dark blue bars on the left, the total amount of spending allowed for non-defense discretionary programs, which is everything for education, training, scientific research, um, uh, border security, FBI, criminal, you know, everything that isn't defense. Um, the caps are really flat from 2016 to 2017, and in fact, they go down next year, which David is going to talk about later. The light blue bars on the right show in inflation-adjusted terms that they actually go down pretty significantly. So these caps are tight. Republicans thought the 2017 level was too high, and so that's where we are right now. If you look at the next slide, please. You will see that Department of Education funding has not been doing too well under these tight caps. The ah, here's my colorful slide. So the the high watermark was 2010, and this is all appropriations for the Department of Ed, not including Pell grants, which are sort of their own separate world. And since 2010, the funding has been below that level. And the bright yellow bars on the right are the levels that were in the House and Senate 
appropriations bills that never came to the floor last year that are still sort of hanging out in the wings. And you can see that the Department of Education was not going to do any better under those bills either. Um, and if you go to the next slide, it breaks it down for elementary and secondary education and higher education, which does include Pell Grants. And you can see that both those categories do significantly worse than they did in 2016 in the bills that Congress was considering. I did not put out here the funding total for adult and career education because it actually is doing better than the rest because it would be frozen under the bills that the Congress was considering. So um, the final thing I wanted to say right here was what do I think might happen to resolve this? We are here five months into a 12-month fiscal year. The continuing resolution goes to the end of April, which brings us to seven months through the fiscal year. And if anyone can tell you with a straight face that they know what's going to happen, that is someone you should not play poker with because they'd be good at bluffing because it's really unclear. Um, I think what is most likely is that we will end up with a continuing resolution, a CR, through the end of the fiscal year, but with a ton of what I refer to as anomal uh, anomalies that make changes necessary for new things, such as the fact that Congress has passed a new elementary and secondary education law that eliminated a lot of programs and created some new block grants and it would make no sense to fund things that don't exist anymore. But I think that the CR for the rest of the year is much more likely to be at the levels of funding in the bills that were pending in the appropriations committees than it is to be at the 2016 level, which overall means a I think a cut for education funding, but possibly a freeze for career and adult education. So that's my take on how we got to where we are and what might happen with 2017. Okay, uh, and I am going to, if we can move to the next slide. <clears throat> Uh, so, um, so I just wanted to follow up on Sarah's uh, 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 great uh, comments there on the overall funding situation, um, and I did want to remind folks of sort of where things stood with some of the key uh, DOL programs and then adult ed and CTE grant programs under the Department of Education. Uh, as you know, Sarah was mentioning, uh, the the way that the the continuing resolution is currently structured. Uh, all of these programs are currently being funded at more or less at the at the same levels that they were funded in, in at fiscal year uh, 2016 levels, so the levels that they were funded last year. Um, and, and there are some differences between the House and the Senate proposed levels uh, for workforce programs uh, under the Department of Labor. So uh, the House more or less kept funding for uh, uh, programs under the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. Uh, at at the current levels, with a, with some small exceptions, you can see uh, the dislocated worker program got a slight bump. Uh, but as Sarah said, the the programs under the Department of Education, uh, adult ed, and and CTE programs were mostly kept level between uh, fiscal year 16 and fiscal year 2017. I should point out though that on the Senate side, the the workforce programs under the Department of Labor did slightly worse than they did under the House version. So there was relatively small cuts, but but cuts nonetheless to programs under uh, particularly the adult dislocated worker and youth programs. So as we're as we're watching the end game, as you know, Sarah was mentioning, we've got the possibility of a continuing resolution which would extend funding at current year at the current levels, so the FY16 levels. That would actually be a good thing for workforce programs uh, because it would be higher than the Senate proposed levels. Uh, but as, as Sarah mentioned, for adult ed and Perkins CTE programs, it's, they, they basically are they're likely to be funded at the same levels that they were funded at last year because both the House and the Senate had proposed the same uh, maintaining funding levels at the same at the same level. Can we go to the next slide? I, I do want to um, so just sort of add on, and, and Sarah had also mentioned the sort of the longer term decline. So I did want to flag that uh, the uh, that funding for all of these programs, workforce, uh, Perkins, career and technical education, and adult education, 
uh, all of the, the funding for these programs has gone up slightly in the last couple of years, but overall we've seen fairly substantial cuts to all of these programs. As you can see, uh, WIA, WIOA uh, formula grants have been cut by 40% in the last 15 years. Uh, Perkins has been cut by 30% in the last uh, 15 years. Adult education has been cut by 20% uh, in the last 15 years, all uh, in, in inflation-adjusted terms. So I think one of the things that, as advocates, as we're thinking about what we're looking for uh, from the funding perspective heading into uh, 17 and 18 as we're talking to policymakers, one of the things that we want to keep in mind is that these programs in particular uh, and, 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 and the broader education and human services uh, uh, programs under the discretionary budget that Sarah is referencing, these are programs that have already seen substantial cuts in many cases over the past 10, 15 years. And so additional cuts uh, in, apart from the from the the damage that they've done to the programs on the ground, are 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 really adding on to a set of cuts that we've seen historically over the last over the last generation. So additional cuts to these programs aren't are no are not necessary. These are not programs where we have too much spending. These are programs where we've actually seen not enough spending. Um, I want to take a, a second to uh, turn things over to David. David, are, are, do you have any thoughts on the FY17 appropriations process and, and where we might end out? Oh, sure. Uh, again, first of all, uh, let me, like Sarah, thank you for uh, the invitation and the opportunity to participate here. Uh, what I think I'd, I, I'd say at this point is really to reiterate a couple of things that have already been said and to focus pretty much on the top line for appropriations, the total for appropriations. Uh, why? I understand that folks on this call are focused on a number of very specific things, but these days the overall top line total has such a tremendous effect on what happens to individual programs that it is worth paying uh, as much attention as possible to. I mean, fundamentally, it is very difficult to row against the current. Uh, right now, the current is frozen totals, as Sarah has said, or even declining totals, and in that overall climate, it's going to be very, very difficult for many things individually to be, uh, to be doing well. Now, again, we're talking here so far about the appropriations world, the so-called discretionary spending, a terrible name. All that means is that the uh, law that sets up the programs leaves Congress with the discretion to decide the uh, funding levels every year in appropriations, as distinct from the entitlement programs, things like Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, where spending is really decided by benefit formulas, eligibility rules, and so forth. And discretionary or appropriated programs, they're about a third of the budget. Overall, of that one third, a little bit more than half is defense, and then the rest is everything else. Now, traditionally, the totals for appropriations were decided every year uh, as part of the congressional budget process, this thing called the congressional budget resolution that is basically the overall congressional plan for the coming year. But ever since 2012, we have had superimposed on that legally binding caps on overall appropriations capped separately, defense and non-defense. It was created by the Budget Control Act of 2011, so it's really, as Sarah and Kermit have said, it's really the caps we're talking about. Now, of course, as you know, there's more. The Budget Control Act of 2011 also kind of took the position in addition to setting these caps, we need more deficit reduction somewhere. And it set up a process to come up with a plan for doing so. It also set up what some would term a fallback position or maybe an incentive position, creating automatic cuts that would take effect if agreement was not reached on an alternative uh, package. And those have the name, you've heard it, sequestration, automatic spending cuts, and indeed, Agreement on alternatives was not reached by the deadline. Sequestration was triggered. It largely operates on the appropriated programs. In the first year, it operated with an across-the-board cut to everything. And you may well remember that. That was 2013. But since 2013, under the law, there are not 
automatic across the board cuts triggered by sequestration, rather sequestration operates to reduce those appropriations caps below the levels that were originally set. And Congress has also, Congress and the President have also sort of come to the realization on a bipartisan basis since then that those cap levels with full sequestration were just too low to meet national needs. So there have been a set of agreements turned into law that reduce the sequestration cuts, therefore let the caps rise a little bit. Those have basically been done two years at a time. The most recent comes or covers 2016 and 2017. So we're in the second year of that. The way that agreement, that legislation was set up, the way the relief was structured, you got an increase in 2016 and then the 2017 cap for non-defense is level with 2016. So that, as Sarah has said and has shown with the graph, that's what we're looking at for 2017, a frozen total, essentially a zero-sum situation. Actually, it's a little less than frozen because, as Sarah said, the uh, appropriations bill for the Department of Veterans Affairs has already been enacted. It's got a $3 billion increase above the year before. So at the moment now, the total for everything else has to come down a little bit $3 billion. Uh, you know, and within that frozen total, realistically, nothing very good is going to happen this year, probably, in terms of non-defense appropriations. Now, the total has to decline a bit. Uh, there will certainly be a few in increases here and there. There is certainly the risk of hopefully relatively simply emphasize the importance of these caps, the importance of these totals, because those totals will be at issue in coming years. And my last thought on this, though, is let's hope they are not at an issue in 2017. That is, while the cap has been set, has been agreed on, it is not impossible that that issue could be reopened. As Sarah mentioned, last year you had a group of Republicans in the House who said, oh no, that level's too high, let's reduce it. So there is still some risk of that, probably not much. The way if that happens, the way it would probably come about is because there is also desire to increase defense spending. And there may be a feeling, okay, we badly need an increase in defense, a feeling on the part of some members, that is. Uh, but we've got to keep overall spending level, so let's cut non-defense commensurately to make up for the increase. I don't think that's going to happen, but watch for that risk, even to 2017. Finally, I will also say that, as you have heard, the Trump administration is very interested in a major new push on border security, on immigration enforcement. The wall on the Mexican border, potentially very expensive, but also potentially a very expensive increase in large increase in the staffing of the Border Patrol, of Immigration and Customs Enforcement, etc. And detention facilities. Now, obviously, we have a long discussion about the merits of that, but I would also these are non-defense. This may well be on the 2017 caps. And I think that is enough of me about 2017. Okay, thank you, David. And, uh, and David, I should say we had a we did have a little bit of audio trouble there for a second. So, folks, if there's uh, if there are questions that you have about anything that David just uh, referenced, please just shoot us a question, and, and maybe we can recap that uh, a little bit later in the webinar. So, I wanted to uh, turn back to you uh, before we start talking about the FY18 budget and appropriations process. I, I, you know, a lot of the folks on the on this webinar are folks who are receiving uh, are, are are participating in federal programs, uh, are receiving federal grants in one form or another to help support their their activities on the ground. I, is there any impact of the delay in the FY17 final appropriations numbers? What is, what's the practical impact? For, for federal agencies and for, for states and localities of the delay in the FY17 final appropriations numbers? Well, for most of the programs, there should not be 
much of an impact because the agencies, you know, they take the total, but they look at it. The, the idea is you're actually spending money at the same rate as you did last year. But the reality is that for most education-related programs, they don't actually start getting their money for fiscal year 17 until July 1st of this year because particularly for school-based programs, it does no good to get your money for the year starting on October 1st when your school year started a lot earlier than that. So most education programs use their fiscal year 17 money for the school year that starts this fall. The real problem is that agencies do not want to start up new spending yet because they don't know how much they're going to have. So if there's a program that's ongoing, they will continue it at the same rate, probably a little bit less, because they're going to be aware that they may end up with less for fiscal year 2017 in total than they had for fiscal year 2016. So they can't spend at a high rate, and then suddenly for the last five months of the year, they don't want to have to restrict funding really tightly to come in at the right amount. Um, but in practice, for most programs, you shouldn't see a difference since they are spending, the, what they're doing now is they're being told to spend at the rate that they did last year. And in fact, most programs for ed aren't spending their money for this year yet. Okay. All right. Well, and so, but that does have an impact. So, for example, there are some programs under the Department of Labor. That, for example, there was an apprenticeship grant program that was uh, that was uh, created as part of the FY16 appropriations process. And I think one of the things to be watching for is whether or not that funding is, is continued as part of the FY17 appropriations process or whether it, uh, or whether it is not. Uh, but I think the agency, if you say, well, many of these agencies are in a position where if it's, a, if it's an existing program with a clear uh, funding, uh, funding process, then they shouldn't be impacted too much. Uh, but it does have some impact on some of the other, uh, some of the other newer programs or where there's less clarity around the, the funding. So, um, right. Well, and also in the education world, there's a whole bunch of programs that really end under, this is not, I know, what most of the folks on this call care about so much, but the elementary and secondary education programs, a lot of them were ended by what's known as ESSA, the Every Student Succeeds Act. And so the Department of Ed is not spending money on programs that have been eliminated, even though under the law that says spend at last year's rate for the programs from last year, that would be what they could be doing. They're holding off and waiting to see what the new funding structure is for new programs. Um, sure. It makes it very hard for states and the agencies to plan for new things when the funding hasn't been provided this far into the fiscal year, that's for sure. That's for sure. Okay, so I want to um, so I wanted to move to talking about the 2018 budget and appropriations process because that's obviously going to be front and center in the next couple of months. And David, can you talk to us a little bit about what's going to be different about the FY18 budget process relative to what we've seen over the last couple of years? And, and talk to us a little bit about what are going to be some of the unique challenges in FY18. Sure. It uh, may actually be uh, different than anything that we have uh, than we have seen in a very long time. Uh, remember, of course, we have a new administration uh, for the first time in some years. The same party controls the White House, the House, and the Senate to the extent that anybody ever really controls these things. Uh, and of course, the new majority, uh, the, uh, uh, the ongoing majority, the new administration has a large agenda, very large budgetary agenda. Basically, they want to change everything, and they want to do it this year. So hang on to your hats, so to speak. Uh, tax cuts. There is uh, an intention to enact large tax cuts process to completely for business taxes. A, there is to repeal the Affordable Care Act and perhaps something or other. There is interest in enacting changes to some of the major benefit programs, things like Medicaid, where there have certainly been announced uh, plans, intentions to perhaps turn that into a block grant instead of an entitlement program that is a program that no longer uh, responds uh, uh, to increased needs or 
uh, to, uh, to changes in healthcare costs. There is, as I mentioned, an interest in very large increases in defense spending. And finally, there's an interest in putting the budget on a path to balance. Now, there is a little bit of a problem with the, arith with the arithmetic here, to say the least, since uh, some of these goals are mutually inconsistent in terms of the effect on the deficit. Revenue losing tax cuts, uh, big defense increases, and so forth. But one of the uh, sort of results of this will be great pressure to further reduce spending to reduce spending on the benefit side and on the entitlement side, and also perhaps to reduce spending on the, uh, the non-defense uh, side. And of course, that's only one of the effects of these things. Uh, there are reasons to be concerned about the substance of the proposed tax policy changes and Medicaid policy changes and the repeal of the Affordable Care Act uh, and so on. But uh, focusing on the topic uh, before us, uh, I did want to point out, uh, in addition to those those uh, concerns, uh, the effect on uh, spending, the pressure for further uh, further decreases. Uh, and going back to uh, appropriations, and this might be a good time. Oh, we have the next slide. I see. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> You know, going back to appropriations, again, I think you have to start by focusing on the total. It's hard to row upstream. At the moment, as I mentioned, the total for uh, non-defense appropriations, uh, or, or the total really for both defense and non-defense, had gotten a little relief from sequestration. That covered 2016 and 2017. That relief expires uh, in 2018. Uh, normally, it would be time for another round of sequestration relief, uh, the way things have gone since the Budget Control Act was enacted, and quite possibly that will happen. But under current law, if nothing changes, the cap for 2018 will go down a little bit. And there's kind of complicated puts and takes as to why it goes down precisely this amount. The amount that it goes down is about $3 billion in sort of plain old unadjusted dollars. And uh, that was shown in one of the um, slides that uh, Sarah showed you earlier. Uh, the overall cap before you start adjusting for inflation or anything else, the cap on non-defense spending will go down by $5 billion. Uh, in relative to David, we, we, we lost you there for a second. Can, uh, you, can you repeat that? They've been enacted. They do missions in order to have funding available. Okay, is this end, I wonder? I, I don't think so. Yeah. Uh, overall, overall cap the current law will go down $3 billion. In addition, uh, we have uh, already enacted advanced appropriations for 2018 for veterans' medical care, because that's just the way these are, these are done, grows by another $3 billion. So everything else is going to have to be about $6 billion uh, bullion under Again, another zero-sum proposition, zero-sum proposition. But really, we, we should look at these, as Sarah and Kermit have, uh, have said, in a little bit of a longer-term perspective as well, because someone could say, well, OK, so it's a little bit of an overall cut in 2018. Percentage terms, it's around a half of 1%. What's the big deal? Well, the big deal is this: we are now in year seven of austerity in non-defense appropriations. 2018 will be year eight. It's been a pattern of ups and downs. On this graph, you see the numbers. You see the numbers in inflation-adjusted terms, constant $2017. And you see overall, despite the pluses and the minuses, the trend has been downward. Uh, and actually, the 2018 cap would be about 16% lower than the comparable level in 2010. 
So this is not a case of a freeze for one year, a little bit of a cut for one year. It's been steady erosion. And obviously, as you know better than I, your costs do go up. That's why we look at things adjusted for inflation. Your rent goes up, your utilities go up, you know, you got to give people a pay raise eventually, and so forth. So the problem is very much cumulative rather than individual. Given that situation, it is possible that Congress will once again come together on a bipartisan basis and say, hmm, we need a little bit of relief from these sequestration cuts, that is, these cuts that came on top of the original cuts, these cuts that further lower the caps. Every year sequestration has been in effect. There has been some relief enacted. It has been re uh, enacted on an equal basis, defense and non-defense. If nothing like that is done for 2018 and beyond, that will be the first time that sequestration has been left fully in effect. Now, it may sound like I'm totally naive. What, this bunch is going to come together on a bipartisan basis and actually increase the limit on spending a little bit? It may be a long shot. I would not rule it out. The way I think it would happen is as Congress starts to act on the 2018 appropriations bills and as they realize they have trouble passing them because the levels are too low. Sometimes too low for things Democrats care about, sometimes too low for things Republicans care about. And certainly as advocates, pushing for that kind of sequestration relief will be very important. Uh, Let's see, it's time for the next slide, I think. And actually, I think the next slide will be something I should have mentioned a minute ago as we talk about the overall uh, downward trend. You know, in addition to just adjusting things for inflation, a standard way of looking at budgets over time is to look at them relative to the size of the economy as a percentage of GDP. That's what this does. And it's a much longer view. It goes back to 1962, which is the first year that data on this basis is available. And it simply shows non-defense appropriated or non-defense discretionary spending relative to the size of the economy. You see, again, there's been ups, there's been downs. The recent trend has been sharply down. That lower dotted line, the sort of reddish line, is the lowest level achieved so far. The So far, the record, the lowest since 1962. We're fast approaching that level. We'll probably hit it in 2018 and then start going below afterwards. There is something very real going on here. The federal commitment to all of these programs that are covered with non-defense appropriations is shrinking. It is shrinking relative to historical, um, historical levels as well as relative to recent levels. So again, given that shrinkage, there is the possibility that we will see uh, eventually some modest sequestration relief, an important goal for advocates. Let's do one more slide. Uh, but then there's also the possibility of something else happening. There is the kind of pressure that I talked about a few minutes ago to reduce spending because of a desire for deficit reduction while doing large tax cuts, while having a large defense spending increase. And uh, we may very well in 2018 and beyond see a push in Congress not to give a little sequestration relief, but to actually cut those caps. And there's various proposals floating around the two. Here's one Trump plan, what I'm referring to, that was floating. It's sound. Every year, you got non-defense appropriations, 1%, from the level of the year before. What's so hard about that? Well, it's kind of freeze plus because we're not talking about cutting percent from inflate adjusted levels or anything like that. It's just take last year's unadjusted frozen level and whack it by another 1% each year. And again, the cumulative effect gets very substantial. Uh, by, the, uh, by the end, and this is a 10-year plan of his, that, you know, that 
whatever it is, sort of yellowish bar, uh, that is 29% uh, below 2016. In other words, over 10 years, a real cut of almost a third. And we have to worry about that kind of thing being enacted, uh, maybe not quite in this form, but certainly worry about a, uh, about a push for further non-defense uh, reductions. Uh, instead of this slide, we slide on the motion that was reported committee last year in the same place, a Republican plan for last year as well. We'll see out the possibility of further cuts will probably play out in the budget resolution that Congress will probably take up. I don't know, everything's so beyond schedule, maybe in May uh, or sometime around then. It's important for people advocating in this area to pay attention to the budget resolution. Budget resolutions are just congressional plans, but you know the people making the plans are the people who are going to carry them out, so those plans should be taken seriously. But again, instead of bad news, there's also, also you know, always the possibility, at least in the coming year, of some modest sequestration relief. It might play out in the budget resolution, but if it happens, not certain at all. I think it will happen as appropriation bills begin to move. So this is a bit about 2018. Okay. Well, and I want to, um, and uh, so we've had a couple of questions that have come in regarding the availability of slides. And just so everyone knows, we'll be we will be circulating an email to everybody who signed up for the webinar. Uh, with a copy of the of the slide, so uh, in the, as we move forward, we'll also uh, we'll try to post a, a Q and A, an FAQ document uh, with some of the specific questions that we're getting around uh, some particular issues. Uh, so so please uh, please stay on the line, um, Sarah. I wanted to I wanted to turn to you as we're thinking about FY18. I think David did a very good job of sort of laying out all the different ramifications that we could see in the FY18 budget process all the different uh, pieces. I, I wondered if you could talk to us a little bit about uh, some of the specific uh, challenges that we might be seeing on the education side. Uh, uh, what, what are we looking at, uh, particularly, and I'm particularly thinking about the, the Pell Grant program. What are some of the challenges that we might see in FY18? Um, well, it's a good question. I think we at the Committee for Education Funding obviously advocate for, you guessed it, education funding. But one of the areas that I'm very worried about is Pell Grant funding. And it is the big cornerstone. It's actually the largest Department of Ed appropriation program. Um, currently, if you look at this slide, the green line, we're providing about $22 billion a year. But the program actually um, has costs a little more than that because there's a little bit of money provided on the mandatory side as well. Um, if I was putting on my budget geek hat, I would tell you how excited I am about this program because it's absolutely unique in the federal government in the way it is funded, but that has no relevance to how students get their money, which is in a one lump sum. Um, but the problem is that Congress every year has to guess how much money this program needs because even though it's funded primarily on the appropriation side, it is spent out like an entitlement. So if someone shows up and applies for a Pell Grant and is eligible for a certain amount, they get that grant regardless of how much Congress provided. And then Congress next year has to repay the federal coffers with extra money. So some years the program runs a shortfall because the estimate was wrong, and some years it has a surplus because the estimate was wrong in the other direction. And what's happened in recent years, you can see that the costs in green spiked after the recession, which is exactly what you'd expect because more people were poorer and jobs were hard to find and more people chose to go back to school and were eligible for larger grants because they were poor. And then as the economy got better, you can see the green line of cost or uh, the program costs have actually gone down and really are bottoming out right about now. And as a result, the blue lines at the bottom, when there was a huge shortfall in 2010-ish, there's now a surplus because Congress kept providing about the same amount of money each year, but hasn't needed so much. So now we have almost $11 billion of money that's provi been provided for Pell that hasn't been used yet. 
And I think what is very likely, um, and the House and Senate Appropriations Committees both did some of what I'm about to talk about in two different ways, is they said, ah, we're not going to keep providing the same amount of money for Pell. We're going to provide slightly less because we can use up some of the surplus for Pell. And so they each provided $1.2 or $1.3 billion less last year in the bills that were percolating their way through. I think what is very possible is going to happen is that in the final bill, either a continuing resolution or an omnibus that clumps a bunch of different bills together, that they will actually provide even less for Pell than they were planning to and use more of the surplus, which doesn't have any effect on the program this year, but it certainly does have an effect as the costs continue to rise in the coming years and as the discretionary caps get tighter and tighter. And if we provide, instead of providing $22 billion for Pell this year, let's just say we provide 15, um, and you use up $7 billion of the surplus, well, then you only have $3 billion in the surplus next year. But now, next year when the caps are tighter, you only provided 17 for Pell, and you actually still need about 22, and you use up your $3 billion of surplus, and you're short. So I'm worried that by using Pell, the surplus now, they're going to find themselves in a huge bind next year and in coming years. Um, there's some other issues about whether they um, Republicans in the in the Republican budgets have proposed to eliminate the money that's already been provided for on the mandatory side to supplement some increases in Pell grants. And if they were to eliminate that, they could afford to cover the cost this year with a surplus, but they would not have enough money to keep it going, and that would actually result in a real cut to the maximum Pell grant next year, which trickles down to being a cut to everybody's Pell Grant, because not only the people with that maximum would get cut, but so would, the, you know, that's what people, have, their awards are based on. Um, they either get the max or some share of the max. So I'm worried that the fact that there's extra money sitting that's already been provided for Pell will be, give a green light to appropriators um, to use, to give less to Pell this year. And I totally understand why they would do that, because they're facing these really tight constraints and they have a lot of compelling programs, but it really would leave students in bad shape for the future for the program. So I want to um, uh, uh, go back to a, a, a conversation that David had raised and, and something that we, uh, as we're looking at 2018, so there's a, obviously there's a lot of different moving parts with the budget and appropriations process on the discretionary side, but I wonder if you, if we could ask uh, David and or, and or Sarah, uh, uh, and I'll let you guys decide who answers this question first, if we could talk a little bit about uh, the budget reconciliation process and what the what the potential challenges are, what we're hearing about budget reconciliation, and, and if you could tell us a little bit about what reconciliation is. Uh, Sarah, do you want, would you, would you be willing to sort of start? Sure. Um, so budget reconciliation is a is a tool that can exist in a budget resolution conference agreement once the House and Senate have agreed on this um, sort of uh, plan of action for going forward. And that budget resolution doesn't go to the President for a signature. It's just Congress setting its plan of how much spending, how much revenue, um, how much debt and deficit for the coming year. And reconciliation is a tool that provides fast track consideration for legislation in the Senate. The House doesn't need to provide fast-track consideration under reconciliation because they have a rules committee that can actually do whatever it wants to control how a bill is um, considered. And so it can give itself fast-track consideration if it wants for anything. Um, but in the Senate, and I'm giving a really uh, uh, superficial description of this because there's lots of ins and outs, but in the Senate it really means that a bill cannot be filibustered, so it only needs 50 votes to pass. But in exchange for having this fast-track consideration, um, there's certain limits to what you can include in a reconciliation bill. So the budget resolution would say, I'm telling these committees to produce legislation that, has, that reduces the deficit by this amount. And then the committees have to come up with whatever the legislation um, that meets that criteria. Generally, Congress has an idea in mind before they introduce reconciliation um, procedures of what they're going to use it for, but the budget resolution can't tell a committee what to do. And if more than one committee has 
instructions, then it's all packed together into one bill, and then that bill passes with an up or down vote. Um, that is often how Congress has passed things that are hard pills to swallow, because you sort of put a lot of bad things in together and maybe throw some good things in and get it done. It is possible um, that reconciliation, what we've been talking about so far, has been the appropriations process and funding for bills on the non-defense side or defense. The reconciliation proposals um, control bills only that have mandatory spending. So that could mean changes to Medicaid, to SNAP, to TANF, to student loans. Um, and they cannot con change Social Security, but they can, I can't remember if it said Medicare. But, uh, but this is where Congress could do, they're planning to use reconciliation procedures to do something to repeal and possibly replace the Affordable Care Act under um, instructions that they passed in January for this year. But in whatever budget resolution they do for fiscal year 2018, they could have other instructions that would eliminate the mandatory Pell Grant or um, do other changes um, Republicans have had in their resolutions a bunch of times, really big changes and cuts to Medicaid by block granting it, as David was talking about earlier. Um, I think, David, do you want to talk about this as well? Not really. Well, uh, <laughs> I think Sarah has really, uh, has, has really uh, summarized it. To summarize the summary, uh, it, we're talking about a special fast-track legislative procedure created by the Budget Act, a means of avoiding filibuster in the Senate. But as Sarah says, in exchange, there are some rules for what you can put in a reconciliation bill, which I will not go into other than to say it's got to be budget stuff. It's you know not a convenient way to go rewrite something about criminal law or financial regulation or something. It's for budgetary matters. And there's also a limit to how many that you can do. And it's a complicated ex explanation of exactly how that works. But in practice, they are set up to do two reconciliation bills this year, as Sarah says. Uh, reconciliation, again, as Sarah has said, is for the non-appropriated side of the, uh, of the budget, for the benefit programs or other programs that are funded outside of appropriations. Reconciliation has not been used for appropriations. Uh, and it's also a potential vehicle for tax changes. Two bills uh, that they are planning to do, which is about the maximum that they can do under the rules. First one, quite possibly, will be new, moving, starting to move in the next couple of weeks in the House if they get a plan together. Uh, it uh, will deal with the Affordable Care Act, with repeal and perhaps some kind of limited replacement, although they get very tangled up in budget rules uh, as they try to do that in reconciliation. At the moment, they're also tangled up in substance as people are beginning to get very concerned about it doing away with repealing a program that's providing health care coverage to 20 million people. And uh, so there are all sorts of internal discussions going on, apparently, about how the Republican majority wishes to put a repeal and sort of replace plan together. But that will probably be the first reconciliation bill. The second one will probably happen this summer. As Sarah suggested, there has to be an intervening budget resolution. So we'll probably see it sometime over the summer, you know, maybe June, July, maybe even in the fall. It's not clear what it will address. The candidates are taxes, certainly. Major objective can be done in reconciliation, though there are some technical and the policy obstacles to that, and also quite possibly benefit cuts, things like block granting or otherwise cutting Medicaid, other programs, and among the universe of programs that folks on this call are particularly concerned about, there is certainly a possibility of changes to Pell, the, the, the business that the part of Pell that goes through the Higher Education Act, uh, not the appropriations bill, and student loans and so forth. So again, there's sort of reconciliation encapsulated. <laughs>
All right. So, uh, so obviously a lot to think about, and, and a lot of different pieces, and, and we've got we've gotten a lot of great questions coming in. Um, and one of those questions that we just got, I think, is uh, helps us lead into the last question I have for you, David and Sarah, from my end, and that is. Um, so what, what steps can advocates be taking, what steps can advocate, should advocates be taking to make sure that we're, we're raising attention to these investments and making sure that these, these programs are preserved? And I'll, I'll take the, the liberty as the moderator of noting that National Skills Coalition, we, uh, we all, always do uh, sign-on letters and action alerts with our network to uh, focus on the appropriation side when it comes to education, workforce, and human services programs that go through the discretionary side. Uh, we just sent a letter up to the appropriations committees a couple of weeks ago, encouraging them to uh, encouraging them to preserve workforce funding. Uh, we also uh, will be doing a, a lot of work, I'm sure, on the 2018 budget and appropriations process. So we'll certainly be circulating uh, materials. Uh, Sarah and David, any other thoughts on on ways that people can be weighing in on the on these processes? Uh, this is Sarah. Oh. Um, if you, uh, David, can I, do you want to go first, or I'm happy to? No, you should go first. Okay. Uh, by all means. So, go. Um, there's one more slide if it can come back, and I will um, use it as a backdrop. But uh, Committee for Education funding is going to launch an advocacy campaign, knowing that. The budget constraints are really tight, but we feel like if you don't ask for something, you definitely won't get it. And we know that the education funding is really only 2% of the federal budget, and we would like to see that increased, not cut. We are just today sending letters to Education Secretary DeVos and to OMB Director Mulvaney, making sure that they know that education is already given at the office. It's been cut a lot. Um, 50 programs have been eliminated since 2010. Um, here's the little slide that shows that there's a little tiny sliver that is education funding out of the entire federal budget, and we think um, it, you know, education funding spent wisely makes a real difference in the economy. We are going to uh, launch a new website next week because our current one is gone through rigor mortis. We can't even revive it, so we are giving up and starting with a new thing. But it will have some tools and some fact sheets and advocacy. And we're really hoping that everybody talks not just to their representative here in DC, but when your senator or member of the House is back home in his or her district, that's a great opportunity. Um, you can see the advocacy that was so strongly evident as the Trump administration came in and was suggesting some nominees that the public weren't entirely happy with. Um, members have really commented on how much they've heard from their constituents. And I think that making your voice known at the local level is such an easy way to let them know what you care about. Because if they don't hear from you, they don't know that you think that career and adult education and um, community college partnerships and grant programs that you receive are important to you. So that's my uh, my advice on how to, to sort of go forth and and ask for what you want. Great, David. Any additional thoughts? Well, yes. Ask for what you want. There's a uh, national debate going on among other things, and it's just very, very in that debate. Sarah says, talk to your representatives. Talk it seems particular. Take those lines. I'd also say, I assist on this call, parts of the country, probably including some, with some senators or representatives who are to federal spending, or maybe even these do not neglect them as well to the extent you can. If representative or senator, uh, it, it's many folks, many people came in government and the government does, or what the, these programs are doing. And, and on in your disputing, maybe here are some 
trust who are in will never change their mind. Okay. Toleration is progress. If you can get members who are hot idea to the point, stop opposing the programs and just being neutral. That is probably some of these list cuts that are circling around on the Republican side in Congress. Uh, you know, get your programs off those lists, even if you don't have members who are willing to say, yeah, I'm for an increase. A good part of the, of the debate, particularly about employment and training programs, is their track record, their degree of success, assertions that these programs just don't work very well. Uh, to the extent you could counter that, that seems a very important message. Also, this business of longer-term funding trends seems very important, particularly when you're do, dealing with programs like the employment and training programs at DOL or career and technical education or adult education uh, at the education department where the long-term funding trends have been downward. Is the tendency to talk about appropriations one year at a time? Yeah, that's how they're done. But you really need to look at the longer-term picture. You're not just complaining about, oh, I'm going to be frozen this year. The point really is, as the slides you've seen that Kermit has, that Sarah has, the point really is that there has been a serious long-term erosion that many people may not be aware of because they look at this one year at a time, and many people may not want because it is unquestionably important stuff we're talking about. And finally, you know, we're talking about advocacy for these particular programs, but certainly at some points in the process, there's need for advocates for all of these programs and work at the top lines on opposing to the cast and urge a bit of relief from the sequestration cuts. Okay, great. And I should, I, yes, and I, and I should mention uh, National Skills Coalition and, and uh, Center on Education, uh, Committee for Education Funding, and others are members of a of a larger umbrella group called NDD United or Non Defense Discretionary United that is doing advocacy here in Washington on. Uh, maintaining uh, the uh, uh, maintaining or increasing the non-defense discretionary spending caps and, and trying to push back on the sequestration process. So um, as as the uh, as we move forward into uh, 2018 and as we're finishing up the 2017 process, we're going to be reaching out to uh, our uh, folks on this call and in our broader network to make sure that we're weighing in with policymakers to understand the importance of of these programs and, and and I think David raised a very good point about not uh, not just about the funding levels but about the effectiveness of the programs that, that you that you all are running uh, why they matter to the communities that you're serving why they matter to the businesses that you're serving uh, really bringing that point home in, in as you as you talk to your members of Congress as you talk to other uh, policymakers uh, making sure that they understand why these programs matter in your communities I think is going to be really critical because as both David and Sarah have said if we don't raise our voices, then there's an assumption that these programs don't have constituencies behind them, and it'll make it that much easier for there for there to be cuts. Um, I wanted to. There's an interesting question that was uh, that was raised, and I want to uh, not take too long uh, with because uh, I know we're coming up to the end. Um, but I did want to. Uh, this was an interesting question. Uh, the question was: uh, So, who is ultimately uh, at the at the when we think about the budget proposal, who's who's actually going to be uh, setting uh, de deciding what the administration's budget proposal is going to look like? Who are the players that we should be aware of? Uh, is it the Office of Management and Budget? Is it the agencies themselves? What is it? What's your sort of thought on what the sort of the administration's role will be in the budget and appropriations process over the next two years? And uh, Sarah, why don't you start? So it's going to be interesting to see. Um, the new OMB director, Mitz Valvini, is part of a group. Was part of a group of members of the House that were really. Um, they did not like the Republican budget that Speaker Ryan and then um, now former Budget Committee Chairman Price put forward because they felt they spent too much. And in fact, um, they proposed budget. The Republican Study Committee proposed a budget two years ago, the last time they did a budget on the floor of the House, that would have cut 
spending by something like six and a half trillion dollars over ten years. And keep in mind that we have a four trillion budget every year, so that's a pretty big percentage cut. What we've been hearing now is uh, the Trump administration has been looking at some budget proposals put forward by the Heritage Foundation that would cut even more. The pie chart you're looking at right now, that's a four trillion dollars, and you can see two-thirds of it is mandatory spending or so. The Heritage Foundation wants to cut a trillion dollars a year. That's a quarter of the budget every year. So you could get rid of all discretionary spending, and that would be about <laughs> what you'd have to do. Actually, it's just it's not possible, I think. Um, but I think it appears, and I obviously have no real insight into what the Trump administration thinks or what their plans are, but they do appear to be looking for some off-the-shelf proposals that they could look for. On the other hand, um, President Trump has talked about a trillion dollar infrastructure plan. He's talked about building a wall that the U.S. would pay for it until Mexico paid us back. These are all things that cost a lot of money, and I don't know how that squares with an OMB director that believes in dramatically shrinking the size of government. Any thoughts, uh, David? Not really. There is. Uh, this is an administration like none under that we've seen uh, that we've seen recently. There seems to be a great diversity of views within it, uh, and it's uh, it may be that uh, unlike other recent administrations, Republican as well as Democratic. Uh, uh, the Trump administration may end up just conceptuals to uh, to, con to Congress to uh, work out the details. I don't know. Uh, I, w I want to go. So there's been a couple of questions about, uh, and, and since Sarah, you mentioned the infrastructure piece, um, can you guys talk to us? And then this will make this the last question, and then um, and then as I said, we'll we'll put out a, an FAQ document to respond to some of these other questions. Can you talk a little bit about sort of the mechanics of if there were to be a big infrastructure or spending package, uh, and I, and I understand that the details are are very unclear at this point. How does that impact, uh, in practical terms, how would that impact this, the, the, the overall budget and spending conversation? David, do you want to go first? Well, <laughs> why not? Um, it's really hard to say because it is very hard to know what administration has in mind. Certainly have been reports that what they find for infrastructure is that of tax uh, for best infrastructure, which would really have to be infrastructure that have every return, uh, all roads, and that would be could be moved, could move separately. The core of it, your funding, and does not pass highways, that airports. Most of that access through fund and other transport. Uh, so you could. Legislation expanding uh, expanding those programs. That would be the issue of cost. That would be another one of these pressures on the plus side of the budget. While at the same time they are trying to reduce and eliminate it, you handle to appropriate could also infrastructure package outside of the appropriations process. For much to happen through the appropriations process, you really would have to raise uh, out from under these caps. I, I, you have the rule significant. It's proposals, but again, 
It's another source of uh, good purposes, uh, but it runs into the desire to simultaneously reduce taxes. Okay. Any any additional thoughts, Sarah? Uh, no, I'm good. I'm I'm having some technical troubles hearing David. His voice is sort of wavering in and out, but uh, I just think that it's going to be very hard to undertake anything big and new in an era when you've got a large part of the Trump administration and a large part of the Congress that wants to shrink the size of government. That's all. Okay. Well, all right. So I, I want to say uh, thank you to both David and Sarah. We're, we're right at time now. And so I want to say thank you to both of you for uh, what, what I think was a really, uh, really useful dive into the budget and appropriations process. Uh, for folks who are on uh, who are on the call and who are paying attention, uh, we are going to be sending uh, we are going to be sending out as I say the slides are going to be going out uh, uh, in an email. Uh, we will also try to pull together a, an FAQ document to respond. We, I know we had a number of questions on specific issues, so we'll send out an FAQ uh, with some clarifications uh, and some answers to some of the questions that were raised. So that'll be made available to participants on the call as well. Um, I want to say thank you again to David and Sarah for your participation, and uh, and with that we'll uh, we'll call it a day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.